Once again, do appreciate everyone being here this morning as we continue our worship, uh, as was referenced in opening prayer, that it would be in spirit and in truth. Uh, so as we consider the things that we are doing uh, come from the Word of God, it is based on that truth. And as this portion of our worship service, as we open up God's Word, uh, we find ourselves in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. As we will consider, Jesus uh, calms the storm. That's going to bring back to to our memories, uh, many of us, uh, uh, this account. Now, following a day full of teaching activity. If you remember, we've been studying from the book of Mark. We're bringing us, ourselves to this, the, you know, the multitudes that he's taught and all. Uh, after a full day of teaching activity, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat to sail across the Sea of Galilee. We find in verses 35 and 36. On the same day, all the teaching that had been going on, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. That's going to be the Sea of Galilee. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. So uh, they're, they've gotten in a bigger boat, bigger, obviously bigger than the other ones that were around. They set, sea, uh, set sail. Uh, a windstorm arose, beating waves onto that boat. A great windstorm arose. The waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Jesus was sleeping but was awakened by his disciples, fearing their lives. He was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? But Jesus rebuked the wind and calmed the seas. He arose, rebuked the wind, said to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He then reproached his disciples for their fear and lack of faith. He said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Notice how he equates the two together there. Filled with great fear, his disciples expressed their awe of Jesus to one another. They feared exceedingly, said to one another, Who can this be? That even the wind and the sea obey him. The account of Jesus calming the storm is well known. Popular in many children's Bible classes, I would say. I would Imagine the ladies that we that teach our, our, our little folks that uh, they, they either have taught or it, it, it's getting ready to be taught about this account. This is a factual account. This isn't a, a, a fable. It's not a parable. It's not a made-up story. It's a factual account, and it's taught. It's taught to our young folks and those, who, those of us who were raised in the church, if you will. We remember being taught when we were in those classes. Maybe we've taught the young folks' classes and we taught that. So it's, a, it's an account that we have heard and we have read and we have studied over and over. The setting for the song, Master, the Tempest is Raging. When that song is sung, how it, it grows in intensity. Master, the Tempest is, is Raging. Many sermons, many lessons have been based on this amazing miracle of, of Jesus. It was a true miracle. It was supernatural. It, it wasn't that anyone could just say to the, the sea to, to, to be still and, and it would happen. But Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, he said he has authority and, and, and it listened. In this sermon, we're going to touch on just a few lessons that can be Gleaned from this event, maybe a reminder to many, maybe something new to others. Beginning with the fact that we are not exempt from storms. We face storms. We face storms because we're humans. Being Jesus' disciples did not protect them from storms. They were with Jesus. They had just been a whole day of, of him teaching the multitudes. They get him in a boat, and here comes the storms. They weren't protected, even, because they, even though they had spent the day serving Christ, be, being at his side as he was teaching, getting him, following his instructions, getting him to the boat, getting him on the sea. The storms came. We live in a world where there are many storms. 
literal, figurative. Come to our minds, we can think of storms. Maybe, maybe we're in the middle of a storm now. Maybe, maybe we're in the eye of a storm. They say it's calm in the eye of a storm. Maybe you know something stormed up and, and now we're in the eye and it's going to get, get bad again. Maybe we see the clouds coming in and, and, and we see something that's on the horizon that, that we can start thinking about. Maybe we're steer, hearing the thunder, seeing the lightning flashes from afar off and we can start seeing uh, storms coming up in our lives. Maybe we can uh, recognize that we've just come through a storm and, and, and hear it uh, now moving on away from us. We know about storms. Christians experience literal tornadoes, hurricanes, just like everyone else. Christians likewise face storms such as sickness, accidents, disappointment, death. Paul certainly experienced the, the perils of storms and shipwrecks. Consider what he wrote in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 25 and 26, letting them know this second letter that he had to write to them, uh, where he says, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In, in journeys often. In perils of waters. In perils of Robbers in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Jesus does not promise exemption from the normal storms of life. We face storms because we're humans. But we who are Christians also face storms because we're Christian. Jesus warned that we will experience tribulation as his disciples. Uh, and, uh, some take this, uh, they'll form this, this false doctrine that there's some future kingdom that, that's coming uh, and there's going to be this time of tribulation. Brethren, the, the tribulation, that, that time frame is spoken of started when the church began. John 16 and verse 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Jesus warned, we're going to expect. We're going to, to experience tribulation. Paul did. He warned his fellow disciples in Acts 14 and verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples... Exhorting them to what? Continue in the faith. Sounds like Jude 3. Doesn't it? And saying we must through many tribulations. We in the first century. He's letting them know that they through many tribulations. And, and until Christ returns we all Christians through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. He wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Yes and all who desire to live godly. So that's a question. Are, are we included in that group, individually, collectively? Do we desire and keep on desiring? Is it a desire? We know what desire means. Is it something, well, we can take it or leave it? Or do we desire it? Who desire to live and keep on living godly in Christ Jesus? Well, you got to get there first will suffer persecution. Peter wrote that we shouldn't even be surprised. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, who's he writing to? He's writing to Christians. That's what beloved means. He's not writing to the world, the general public. He's writing to Christians. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Jesus does not promise exemption from the storms of religious persecution. So, if and when we find ourselves in the midst of storms, whether literal or figurative, whether it's because we're simply human, or whether it's because we're Christians, don't think it's strange. No, don't think it's something strange. Instead, take heart knowing that Jesus helps us deal with storms. Through faith, 
during storms, we're often afraid. We're perishing. His disciples said, we're perishing. Don't you care anything about it? We're perishing. We find ourselves in, during storms, literal, figurative. We're afraid. Jesus teaches that fear is indicative of a lack of faith. Is that different now? Is it different for us than it was in the 21st? Now, fear doesn't mean lack of faith. No, it still does. To overcome fear in storms, we need to grow in faith. To overcome fear in storms, literal, yeah, figurative, yes. We need to grow in faith. Faith that God will protect us if it be his will. Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Let's go back and look at that. God is our refuge and strength. Is that the case? A very present help in trouble. Do, do we understand that? Is our faith strong to where we understand that no matter what? God is our refuge and strength. Therefore, we, those who God is our refuge and strength, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed. We will not fear. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, we will not fear. Though its waters roar, we will not fear. Though, though its waters be troubled, we will not fear. Though the mountains shake with its swelling, we will not fear. God is our refuge and strength. Faith that God will deliver us to his heavenly city, uh, even if we die. Psalm 46, verses 4 and 5. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Consider Psalm 46, verses 10 and 11 now. Be still. Oh, that's so hard. That's so hard. It, it, it's hard for the littlest child to the, to the oldest of this person. Be still. Be still. Be still and know. Not be still and, and guess. It's not be still and wish. It, it's not be still and well, I'll think about it. Be still and know. That is a knowledge. That is something we can know. That's something we better know. The passage was read for the Lord's Supper. Brother Andy read, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Do we know his word? Do we know the truth? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Jesus reveals the role of faith in the midst of storms. So Jesus helps us deal with storms through faith. Jesus helps us deal with storms through his word. Jesus' word prepares us to withstand the storms of life. Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does and keeps on doing that that verb is in the greek tense is does and keeps on doing them right many people say well all you have to do is believe all you have to do is hear no those who hear these things and keeps on doing them i will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock what difference does that make whether my house is built on a rock or whatever well there's still some storms the rain descended is it because they were human? Because they were Christians? It, it, you know, what, what, what? Doesn't matter. The rains came. The, the, the floods came. The winds blew. Beat on that house. Well, it wasn't just that house. It was beating on. It was beating on every other house in the neighborhood. But it was beating on that house. And it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. But... Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not keep on doing them 
will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain, same rain. Really, it's the same figurative house. It's not, it's not the house wasn't built different. It's built on sand rather than on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, it fell. And great was its fall. Jesus reveals the role, role of faith in the midst of storm. Right? So, so Jesus helps us deal with storms through faith that, that we get through his word. Through his word. Well, how to pray in order to be heard by God. Do we, if we pray, do we want it to be heard? Are we praying just to be praying? Are we just doing something to fill in a gap? We didn't have nothing else better to do? Or are we praying in order to be heard by God? Matthew 6, verses 5 to 8. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Now, is there a problem praying uh, within the congregation? Is there a problem praying on the street corners? No. But if it's that you may be seen by men, if that's the, the result you're looking for, there's a problem. Surely, I say to you, they have their reward. So if you just want to be heard by men, you got your reward. If you want to be heard by God, then don't pray like that. Don't pray like the hypocrites. But you, when you pray, it doesn't say if you pray. He says, when you pray, go into your room. When you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. Vain repetition. I think I've heard about that. I've, I've seen something about that. The, you know, people, you have the, their little prayer books and somebody will say something. They vainly just, just wrote repetition, repeat it back, and think, well, that's what he's talking about. That, that, that's, if, if that's what you're all about, you've got your reward. You've got your little gold star. You've got your check mark. He's saying, don't use vain repetitions as the heathens do. Oh, but those are Christians. No, they're heathens. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, don't be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you even ask Him. Jesus reveals the role of faith in the midst of storms. So Jesus helps us deal with storms. We know we're going to have storms. Because we're humans, because we're Christians, literal, figurative, whatever it be. But Jesus helps us deal with that through faith, through his word, through his word we learn how to pray, through his word to, to, to lay up treasure in heaven instead of on earth. Matthew 6, verses 19 and 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Don't do that. But instead, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Same thing, so, you know, from the storms. You know, if, if, if all of our lives just take stuff from storms. Well, no, it's, we, we lay up our treasures in heaven. Storms can't reach them. Jesus reveals the role of faith in the midst of storms through his word to, to, to seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, verses 31 to 34. Therefore, do not worry. Worry. Well, what about if there's a storm? Don't worry. But what, what, what if the, 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 the waves are just beating and they're filling up the, the, the figurative boat? Don't worry. God is our refuge, our strength. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Well, if I, if I can't do that, if I'm not to worry, what do I do? What do I do with my time? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own thing. Sufficient. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. If you're having troubles today, why do we want to compound them? I worry about tomorrow's troubles on top of today. Worry about those things. Jesus shares the secrets to standing strong against the storms of life. 
through prayer. Jesus is key to receiving mercy and grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. The Hebrews writer says, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, those that have an understanding of the Old Testament, what it meant with the priesthood and the, the high priest and what they did, but now we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens. That should be calming right there, just having that knowledge. So when the storms arise, well, I've got a high priest who's passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession because we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. In the midst of his, he was on that boat too that was filling up with water. He was tempted to say, we're perishing. But he knew the truth. It was the truth. He is the truth. Tempted with all, in all ways, yet without sin. So, so what do we do with that? Let us, Christian, he's writing to Christians, therefore come boldly. We looked at that word this morning in our class. That's with confidence, prepared. We can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain grace and, and find grace to help in time of need. Well, what would that be? That's when the storms. But we already have this knowledge. We know that we can trust that. And it will be there in time of need. He goes on in chapter 7 and verse 25. Therefore, he, who, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Again, that preposition through, very important. You can't go through something without getting in something, right? You can't come through Christ Unless you get in Christ. So you can't come to God through him without getting into Christ since he always lives to make intercession for them. Well, who are them? Who does he make intercession for them? Those who have come to God through him. In anxious times, God offers peace to God, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus through prayer. So let's look at Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. So Paul's writing to the Christians there in Philippi. Not the world in general, not the general public. This, what, this isn't a postcard that was just mass sent out to everybody and says, if this ain't you, to whoever's the resident of this house is now. This was written to Christians. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Okay? I, I can do that. What, what's going to happen? Well, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard. That guard is, a, the Greek word is really a garrison. We'll put a garrison around. Now that's a guard, right? You want to be guarded. You put a garrison around something. Will guard your hearts and minds. There's that preposition again. Through Christ Jesus. He's not going to do that for those who are in Christ. But for those who are, those Christians that, that Paul wrote to, to include Christians today. Jesus stands ready to calm our hearts and minds when facing storms through his sacrifice. Through, through the, the great storm all of us will face will, will be the day of judgment. Try to think about it. If we think of any of the worst storms we've ever been through. Well, but you start thinking there's going to be a, 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 a day of judgment there. 2 Peter 3 and verse 7 says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, it's the same word that's spoken into existence, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So this fire and perdition it is there for ungodly men. 2 Peter 3, now verses 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Boy, what do we do? Now, knowing that that is the case, that there will come a day that that will happen. 
What do we do? That's a good place for a therefore. Therefore, since we know that, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? If you know this is happening, what do you do about it? Well, if you know a storm's coming, your people live at the beach. Oh, there's a big hurricane coming through. What do they do? They go start putting up. They prepare for it. Right? They, they know it's coming through. They put up all the boards and stuff on the windows. They're prepared for it. So why do we miss it when it comes to spiritual matters? We know that that day's coming. So how should we prepare for it? How should we conduct ourselves? Since all these things are going to happen, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for, hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt with fervor. You mean we should desire that to happen? We should hasten that? We should pray for that to happen? Well, it depends on whether you're prepared or not. Day in which we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body. According to what he has done. What if I did good? Yeah. What if I did bad? Yeah. Whether good or bad. We're going to receive that. But Christ shed his blood to spare us on that day. Romans 5 verses 6, and 6 to 10. Written to Christians. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, much more then. Having now been justified, by his blood. So now this is really into where we, now we know he's writing to Christians because those who haven't obeyed the gospel haven't been justified by his blood. But now having now been justified by his blood, we Christians, we shall be saved from wrath, there's that preposition, through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The we, the, the pronoun, they're still going back to the antecedent. Those who have been justified by the blood of Christ, by obeying the gospel. Now many people today will say, well, I'm a good person. You ain't good enough. Don't let anyone deceive you. You ain't good enough to save yourself. It's only by the blood of Christ. Well, I'll do it my way. No, you won't. You might be deceived, you might let yourself be deceived, but you will not save yourself. Outside the blood of Christ, you will be condemned. By obeying the gospel, we can have our names added to the Lamb's book of life and escape condemnation of our sins. Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. Yes, said Revelation, don't be scared. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from, the, from whose face the earth and the, the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And that's the one we want to think about in this context here, this book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. And we've already established that's whether good or bad. By the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death. Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. They were judged, each, each one according to his work. Then, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Sounds pretty important to have our names in that book of life, doesn't it? And we know how to get our names written in that book of life and keep our names written in that book of life. Jesus stands ready to save us. Jesus stands ready to protect us from the perfect storm to come. Everyone will face one or more storms in his or her life, whether literally, metaphorically, 
allegorically, whether atheist, believer, how shall we react when the times come? Shall we cry out like the disciples who were weak in faith? We're perishing. Is that where we go? Is that our natural reaction to a storm? Literal? Figurative? Because we're humans? Because we're Christians? We're perishing. Or shall we weather the storms with confident faith? With calm demeanor? Because of our great high priest? How shall we stand when the final storm comes? The perfect storm, we're using that figuratively as the day of judgment. When that day comes, shall we hear Jesus say in Matthew 25, verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Prepared? Kingdom prepared is prepared for a prepared people. Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Will that be what will he, we will hear him say? Or will we hear him say, that he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me. You cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. He got those on the right hand. He got those on the left hand. Where are you? This isn't political. This is spiritual. When Jesus rebuked the wind, when he spoke to the sea, peace be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. The disciples, with fear and amazement, said, who can this be? That even the wind and the sea obey him. He didn't see obey his disciples, his followers, those who had just spent all that day and many others as he was teaching the multitudes. They said, who is this? The wind and the sea obey Jesus. Shall we not obey him? Who now has all authority in heaven and on earth. Well, how do we do that? We've already established by faith Hearing the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Believing the, the gospel, believing the evidence, just as the evidence that we just presented. This, this is evidence that, that, it, that has been put into permanent record, has been recorded and preserved so that we can go to this account, we can teach it to our kids, we, we can continue to learn it, that this is what happens. Do you believe it? If so then it's going to move one to, to that godly sorrow that will produce that repentance that leads to salvation. We've got to repent. We've got to stop doing those things that separate us from God. We've got to change our outlook on what sin is. We've got to make the good confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God based on that evidence. That's what the Scriptures teach. We must do this. We must hear the Word. We must believe the Word. We must repent of all sins. We must make the good confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we must be immersed in the waters of baptism. I've used the term preposition a number of times. You go, be, go through Christ to get to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. You can't go through something until you're in something. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Do you need any more? Romans 6, 3 and 4, there, there's plenty of passages that talk about getting into Christ, putting on Christ. It is essential to be immersed into Christ. Christ, the body of Christ, which is the church. There's only one. If you haven't done that, you're not in Christ. You're still going to face storms. But you don't have the peace that passes all understanding. You don't have God hearing your prayers and guarding your heart. You may think you do. Satan will deceive anyone into thinking that they do, but they don't according to the word. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, we want to help you with that. For those of us who have, that's the beginning. We must remain faithful. Even through the storms, we must remain faithful. Not saying we're perishing 
with a calm demeanor, knowing that that day will come when we'll face Christ. Will we be prepared? If we can help anyone in any way, please come as together we stand and sing.